Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'd just like to first apologise for my voice. I have a cold, my throat's really sore, and if this video is jumpy, it's because I've edited out my sneezing. Um, yeah. This video was way more requested than I expected it to be, so I put a poll out on my YouTube channel community page and I asked if you wanted a real time study with me, a revision guide study with me type thing, or a life update about my dissertation and future plans and whether they've changed from my last video. And about like 67, maybe more actually, of you voted for the dissertation video. So I have my list of things to talk about and it's actually in my unique notebook just constantly repping <laughs> so let's get started I'm gonna discuss my dissertation first because I'm gonna try and do this in chronological order so I have just finished my dissertation if you are new to my channel then I'm a third year archaeology and anthropology student at the University of Oxford I've just completed my dissertation and I'm gonna talk about what it was about because I changed my subject from the last time I talked to you and also what kind of this means for my whole degree having this in. So at Oxford doing archaeology and anthropology the dissertation is currently worth 22% of your final grade which is equivalent to two out of nine exams. So we have seven more exams and this is two exams. on whatever you want as long as it is archaeological or anthropological because you know that's the degree and it is best to do something that's kind of analytically challenging that's gonna make you have to explore a new area with new ideas and show that you can argue in your favor and also criticize yourself and yeah just be able to write a long piece so this is 80 pages this is quite a long dissertation uh, it, it hasn't met the word count in actual words, but I have a lot of graphs, so quite possibly there's another 500 words in that. You have to write 15,000 words, or between 12 and 15, but it's actually quite hard to limit yourself to 12, because there's a lot. I have a lot of appendix as well, so that's why mine's so long, but my actual writing is about 55 pages on size 11 times New Roman. So. This is the cover of my dissertation. I don't know if you can read the title, so... It is an investigation into... I actually don't know what my own title is. I came up with this title really last minute, so... That's why I don't know it myself. So we are told to start researching our dissertation pretty much as soon as Easter comes in second year. And... That doesn't usually happen. <laughs> or at least I did not. I tried to think of topics, I really struggled with this because it, is, it isn't easy at all and um, I came up with an idea that I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to focus on children in archaeology because they're quite an overlooked category mostly because you know most people grow up so there's not a lot of children in the archaeological record particularly ones that survived the test of time in the ground because bones are more brittle when you're a child and smaller and easier to like lose and break during the excavation process. So I was really interested in that because um, it can also tell you a lot about status and whether status was just an adult thing or whether status was born, ascribed from the, the amounts of like funeral goods that people find in graves and um, I find that really interesting personally. So I decided to do about children and my original idea that I researched for the whole of summer did not happen. November comes around and I get given a set of data from my supervisor and it is for a site in Siberia. It's actually three different archaeological sites in Siberia dating to the Neolithic period which is about 8,000 to 6,800-ish 
years before present at one of the sites, two of the sites, yeah, two of the sites, and then there's an 800 year gap in settlement, and then there's a site dating to about 6,000 to 3,500 years before present. These sites are all Neolithic hunter-gatherer sites, so if you want to know more about hunter-gatherers then just Google search, there's loads and loads of research into that and also the Neolithic, you'll get a pretty easy explanation of what that entails. The idea behind my project was to look at how children are aged from their long bones. And when I mean aged, I mean their age at death. So long bones are these bones, so the humerus, the radius and the ulna, and you have the femur in the leg, and the tibia and the fibula in the lower leg. And the femur is, has been proved previously, according to certain sources, that to be the most correlated to the age found in the teeth. And the teeth can age children because of their growth trajectory almost, so they grow pretty much at the same rate across many, many populations. There is a few fluctuations. It's the best method of ageing children that is available, basically is the theory behind this. So, the tooth age was taken to be actual age, or at least the most accurate age estimation possible, and I was comparing those tooth ages to age from the long bones. So in order to work out age from the long bones, you need a formula. Now, I was looking specifically at what's called a regression formula, which basically fits as best possible the ages of a population into like a straight line graph. But these regression formula were all pre existing formula based on other populations. So, as growth on the long bones is very, very different both inter and intra population, it's not great to just rely on an age formula from a random population that may or may not have grown very, very differently to the population that you personally are trying to age. I decided that I would compare three different formula, these are pre-existing age estimation formula, from three different places across the world which share some sort of similarity to the people that I was looking at in Siberia. Formula number one uh, was created by people called Primo et al, which I'll link the paper in the description so that you can actually have a read of it. Um, and that was made for a population in Denmark in the medieval period, which is actually a very similar latitude, which is like how high above the equator you are, <laughs> to the population that I was looking at. And the climate environment is likely to be pretty similar, though also Denmark is coastal and Siberia is very continental, so there are differences, but it's about as close as I could get with a formula that had already been made. There is another formula. Formula number two is by a people called Danforth et al. 2009. Again, I'll link it in the description or at least the, the page where you can find an abstract of their paper. And that paper was based on a Mesoamerican group from Belize, and it's a Mayan, Mayan group from the like 16, 16th century, 1600, yeah, 16th century. And basically, it has been found that the later dates at Siberia, so the ones that were dated to around 6,000 to 3,400 before present, shares like haplogroup DNA with people from. Native America, both North and South America. So it was hypothesized that this later Neolithic group would possibly produce more accurate age estimations using the that, that South American formula. Formula number three was a control formula meant to basically just not be accurate, just to try and prove that it was those factors that were making the formula accurate and not just that. It doesn't matter what population you choose. 
turns out it definitely does matter what population you choose. The third formula, which was written by Facini and Vesci, I don't know if I've said that right at all, but again, I'll put it in the description, did not produce good results. Did not. Uh, it was considerably less accurate for my population than the other two, which was expected because it was different. They didn't share a climate, they didn't share latitude, probably didn't share diet because one was a sedentary population and one was a hunter-gatherer population and didn't share genes as far as we are aware. For the FEMA, remember I said that that was possibly the most accurate compared to the teeth, performed significantly better with the Primo et al formula, which was based on the environment. And this was basically expected because the legs have been proven by previous research again to be most affected by the environment in terms of their growth and how fast or slow they grow, whether they actually meet their maximum potential. There's also all sorts of other technical reasons, including things called crural indices, which is like the ratio of top limb segment to proximal limb segment to distal limb segment, limb, limb segment, but I would be talking for hours and it probably wouldn't make any sense, so I'm not even going to go into that. But yeah, essentially, the Primo et al formula seemed to work best and the other limbs performed pretty much the same between Danforth and Primo et al, so I took it that it would be best to go for the environment if you were using the FEMA. Yeah, that, that is my dissertation, so I'm hoping that future researchers can then use this to like plan what population they are going to choose ask you how you are you just yeah. have to say that you're fine when you're not so the second thing that is on my list is exams revision what I'm kind of doing now that I finished my dissertation so I still have seven exams yes I have finished all of the teaching in my degree I've done all of my tutorials I have no more essays due that I have to hand in every week like I had before. But I do still have all of my revision to do for these seven exams. And before I have these seven exams at the end of May, I have six mock exams in April. So I'm treating those as real exams. So if I release like study with me content, it will always be me revising for either my mocks or my finals which is what we call them. Finals are final exams. <sighs> yeah, my exams are all three hours long. I'm hoping to do an exam video diary. So obviously I can't film in the exam, but I'm going to be filming my like morning routines before the exam. I might say this and then realise it's too hectic and then not do it and just talk about it in retrospect. But that's what I'm hoping to do. After my exams, I have two weeks left of rent that I can stay in my room, so I'm hoping that I can just relax. And then after that, I am flying to Spain to go and do an archaeological dig, which I am super excited for because I haven't done one that's not in England ever. So this is a paleoanthropological dig, which basically means it's really old. It's Neanderthal age, as far as I'm aware. And they have been finding Neanderthal skeletons. Now, th these are really rare, so I don't expect to find one, but if I do, that would be, honestly, possibly the highlight of my life. Uh, you know, like, absolute childhood dream. When I grow up, I want to be a vampire bat. <laughs> After summer is still a bit of a mystery to me, to be honest, I'm hoping that I can get some sort of work for one year so that I can afford my masters in the next year. I don't know what I want to do with my masters yet, I'll talk about that a bit more in a second, but in terms of work, like, I would really, really like to either work with children and young people, so either in a school, in an outreach centre, for an outreach charity, that sort of thing, or 
go and get archaeological experience in either excavation or like museum curation. The issue with those are a lot of museum positions are voluntary and as much as I would love to do that, the whole purpose of this year out is so that I can afford my masters. So just doing a whole year of volunteering is not going to be productive and I may as well have just gone straight into my masters. This is my dilemma. <laughs> I am thinking I'm going to have to go for the first route and do like outreach or teaching then like volunteer on the side maybe at weekends so it's going to be difficult but I think I'm going to really enjoy it and I'm really excited I'm looking at jobs now the issue is Manchester doesn't seem to have a lot of jobs compared to Oxford and I need to stay at home because Oxford rent is extortionate and by that I mean like private rent it's ridiculous so I need to stay at home up in the north and yeah basically trying to sort my life out um so on to the masters talk um <laughs> I don't really know where I'm going. I really like Cranfield. I discussed Cranfield in my previous one of these videos. It's a Ministry of Defence owned campus uh, which basically does lots of forensic -y type things. So it could be forensic intelligence, forensics, as, in, as you'd imagine forensics, and also a lot of defence stuff, which is not what I'm going to be doing, but that's what they do at the same campus. The main positives about this course is that it's very much job focused so it's like forensic society accredited or something like that. It has like a courtroom thing that they then, that you can like share your cases in and it's it's very up to date, it, it just basically looks really good but it's expensive. It's like 12,000 ish which is a lot for a masters. A lot of masters are like between six and ten thousand. Uh, this one is clearly not. Edinburgh is another one I'd like to go to, but again, is twelve thousand, and it's not forensics. It's human osteoarchaeology, which is great. But I've kind of already done that, so I did that in my human osteoarchaeology module, and I quite like to be challenged. As much as I don't want my masters to be a follow-on of how intense I've been working in the last three years. I also don't want to just repeat what I've done already and I'd rather be challenged by new stuff and keep excited because I'd get bored basically and I don't want to pay for something that I don't think is new. So I'm in the process of going to open days and doing like online open days and if I do go to an open day I'm going to try and vlog it though I don't know like a complete weirdo before I even got there so don't count me on that um what else am I doing oh yeah I'm gonna have to write another personal statement so enjoy those videos that will come out after my masters I would quite like to be a forensic anthropologist or forensic archaeologist I haven't decided which one I want to do yet so the difference is the archaeologists like do the excavation and the anthropologists just look at the body and this is modern this isn't historical but quite often if the police find a skeleton that they're not sure is modern or old the forensic archaeologists will again be called and along with the anthropologists will have to like decide how old it is and whether to send it off to the lab, whether it's even human. I also definitely do want to do outreach work so whether I do forensics for a bit and then swap or kind of do them both part time alongside each other I'm not sure yet. I think more realistically I'll probably do forensics forensics until I like I don't know, have a family or whatever and then come back to do outreach or teaching because I just find that so rewarding. I, I've tutored, I've done summer schools, I've taught lectures to young people and really thoroughly enjoyed doing it and their reactions. So 
that is a big possibility. Maybe I'll go back to uni and do like a PGCE or um, PhD. Though that's a lot of time and I don't know whether I want to put myself through that unpaid. So that is the end of my video. I will be back soon with a study with me vlog, revisionally type thing because I've already started filming it so look out for that. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it or you know what if you just understood a word I said about my dissertation so let me know if you think like this was a good idea in the comments. Subscribe if you aren't already and I will see you soon. Thank you again. Bye! Uh, turn off!